Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox, Introduction to Cloud Computing and Big Data slash Data Engineering. Part J is software, cloud software. And let's get on with it. All right, so we're in the unit for cloud software. This is my research area, so maybe what I say has a little more um, substance than normal. Uh, we start off with the discussion of the high performance computing, which is a field concerned with getting good good performance, which you always want. And the so-called Apache Big Data stack, the software stack, the collection of over, well, there are many more than 350 now. I gave up in January 2016, and I stopped recording them. But uh, there were 300, over 350 in January of 2016. And then I put them in 21 different layers, and each of those layers had uh, the, covered a particular part of the whole raw software ecosystem. We point out that Google's made huge contributions here and gives highlights to that, not in all 21 layers, but in many of them. We describe their key technology map produce in pictures. And then we compare the cloud software stack with the high performance computing software stack. Cloud is much more flexible and powerful. The high performance computing software stack is rather focused and but actually runs a lot faster at times. Then we look at whatever we need to support a rather general cloud or distributed systems programming environment. All right, let's get on to the details. Thank you. All right, now we have the famous HPC ABDS, High Performance Computing Enhanced Apache Big Data Stack with the 350 uh, software uh, systems that I uh, gave up um, updating in January of 2016. Um, so in here you also see there are actually 21 uh, layers. They're numbered from one to 17, but um, four of them have, uh, or, or three, three of them have uh, a, a, B, or A, B, C uh, divisions. The 14 and 15 are A and B, 11 are ABC showing. I didn't quite do the layers correct, so I sliced up the software stack. Uh, the ones on the uh, right here are cross-cutting. Like security is not really a layer, it uh, runs through everything. As is messaging, it runs through everything, or message protocols do. Um, and here we basically start from the bottom, that's infrastructure. And then right at the top with workflow slash orchestration, which is how to join multiple jobs together. And in between them, we build a job with some data, some messaging, some programming systems, libraries, and so on. Here we're managing the cluster, the file systems, the actual resource management, and we have various standards for interoperability, and we have DevOps, which is automating the infrastructure. So this is not all Apache big data. There are some commercial products here. There's some non-Apache open source like MongoDB. There's some commercial products, but they all come from the same community um, and represent the state of the art in big data systems. And around January 2016, we were kept on updating it every month for several years. Um, I decided we had enough, and the picture was clear. I was no longer getting any new information in my update. So uh, the other comment on this, some of these are green. Green are the layers we happen to work on in this big NSF project I have, 14-43054. Um, those are where we, Researchers in academia focus. Okay, now as a backdrop to this is actually what Google does. So Google is, of course, the pioneer, or probably the original pioneer, and now a very competitive pioneer in the field. And it keeps on doing wonderful software. And here we have a sort of history which Google likes to show on in this slide here. And I've written it out here because you can see it more clearly. Uh, starting with the Google file system, which is shown here, then the most famous probably MapReduce, and going on to Cloud Dataflow, which um, 2015, 
And then we've written the equivalent Apache uh, technology where it exists. Um, now, some are, now we've also written the layers. See, these like level eight is the layer or level of the HPC ABDS. Um, some of the capabilities we don't have in here because maybe Google hasn't openly written a seminal conference paper or journal paper. Uh, security data transfer, scheduling, DevOps. Although Kubernetes is DevOps, which is um, from Google, because it's, but it's not really all of DevOps. It's just a very particular DevOps technology. And then we have serverless computing, where Google offers it on Google Compute Engine, but they don't have anything like a revolutionary paper, which uh, which say because partly because they didn't invent this. This came from Amazon with uh, Lambda. Uh, I don't even think Amazon had a revolutionary paper. Uh, and this is now Apache OpenWhisk serverless computing, but Google didn't contribute that. But anyway, they've actually contributed in the majority of these layers, and they typically were the first. Uh, Big Table was the first, NoSQL database and things like that. Prego was one of the very first. Um, um, uh, iterative map producers, where we actually we were actually somewhat before Prego, because that's not surprising. You know, academia does these things out there. Okay, here is a four slides discussing MapReduce, uh, which was a really staple technology for big data, and it was one of the most. It's possibly the most successful approach found to process bulk data. In some sense, it is sort of trivial. But it's actually pretty important to recognize things that are trivial and realize they're important. And that's whether or not it was trivial, it was certainly really important. And um, it was um, in, introduced by Jeffrey Dean and Sanjay Gemawat in 2004. And it's been hugely successful as seen by uh, the 31,000, over 31,000 citations. And it is. What used to be called data parallelism, uh, it's founded on data parallelism, which was actually well understood. It just was, and it was actually dominantly used in the simulation area, but it wasn't maybe quite so well understood in the big data area. And I think people like, say, me, who worked in the simulation area before then, didn't realize that this was quite so important for big data because we didn't know what the big data problems were. Now we do when we realize. MapReduce is very important, but uh, that wasn't so when all this stuff was done. The exact way it's done is a little different. They're actually somewhat simpler than the way it's done in uh, simulations because it's a less the uh, synchronization is uh, if, uh, is less uh, uh, stringent. Uh, here we have an animation of our Mr. Sam and. Um, the animation, unfortunately, goes rather fast on this particular recording. If you just play the um, online uh, slides, you will see they will play slower and more under your control. control. And uh, But you can see that if we want to make an apple juice here, we do uh, a, um, a map, which is the cutting of the apple. That maps it from apple into juice. Well, apple into apple slices and then we do another map into uh, into um, juice, but these are just sequential maps, lots of maps, uh, and there is a bit of a reduction because we're we do have to communicate from the gr the uh, um, the grinder to the uh, to the to the vase and from the apple to the apple slices, and the apple slices have to be uh, placed in this uh, fruit squasher. Okay, well here is probably, this is gonna go too fast. And here we have the parallel version of this, which is not only parallel, then you have lots of sources of fruit. It also is doing different problems. Now we we're making three different types of juices. And um, there, this is the reduce stage, where things are communicated. These are map stages, where things are changed to their state. This is another map. And 
You can see how these can be thought of as key value pairs. We have the key called A, O, and P, and everything is, um, and then we have the A slice, O slice, P slice, and uh, then we can form sort of combinations like AO, when we mix uh, oranges and apples for a particular punch. Uh, if we now click this again, it will hopefully, uh, um, actually, I think I have to do this. Yes. So this sort of summarizes how MapReduce maps one list of key value pairs to another list of key value pairs. And here are the key value pairs at the top, and here are the key value pairs at the bottom. And we have mapping and communication linking them together. So this just summarizes again that um, a programming model with lots of data and you know it's terabytes, petabytes, and so on, and it's um, large numbers of connected computers. Which are, well, I sort of tried to illustrate that in the previous slide, where we had lots of knives. Each of those knives was a computer or a disk. Well, the baskets were the disk, is where you read the data from the apples and the oranges and things. And this is either parallel computing or distributed computing. Uh, typically, it's run on a single cluster, which means that uh, it's, that's usually what's called parallel computing. However, it's loosely synchronized, so that's sort of a characteristic of distributed computing. And it has these two key parts, a map and a reduce. But parallel computing always had maps and reduces, so it's not that. Um, that distinctive, but it's incredibly important. I wish I made a mistake. I didn't mean to downplay it. It's really important. All right, here is an example coming from Judy Chu, who talked cloud computing for many years with great success, and it uh, was here's an illustration of its uh, its operation. So you have a program which has Input data, which is split into parts, one per processor, or one, or one per process, or, or, or thread. And uh, those go to workers. Um, and these workers are on the map side, the map actually do the work. And the reduce side, the reduce add up the work of the, map, of the, uh, of the uh, workers, sorry, of the maps. Um, and they each run on either the, they can run on the same computers or different computers, um, but there are these two stages, uh, and they're linked by writing to disk on your local disk. That is why you one has, for instance, in the um, Hadoop, which is the Yahoo and now open source implementation of MapReduce. Um, it has HDFS is actually possibly the most famous part of of, um, of Hadoop, which is the Hadoop. Uh, File system which allows you to have disks on the disks on the nodes of, with the maps that are running being used to dump the data. And then the final answer, which I mean a typical reduce is a rather generalized reduce. It's not what actually some fields would call even reduce. They might call it a gather. And a typical example is search. The map is diligently searching for what it wants on the, among the Split up data, and the reduce does a sort on the reduce to sort the results in the order of uh, most relevance. But it joins the results of the maps together. That's the so-called reduction. It's actually an increase operation, not a reduce operation. Um, this slide here is um, class of, uh, sort of standard slide I've used in many forms for several years. On, on with this side here, the left, it has the uh, big data stack, and on the right, it has a, what you might call a classic cluster stack. And it has these different layers. Doesn't quite have all the layers, because some of them uh, we don't uh, particularly highlight in, in these when thinking about these stacks. Um, I like we don't actually have DevOps here, even though we're going to use DevOps. Um, so. <coughs> We start at the bottom with infrastructure, which, as I said, is going to be Docker or serverless uh, these days for uh, big data. 
And on the right is basically Linux or bare metal, and SRIOV is a technology to allow OpenStack to run very fast on supercomputers. Uh, data management might be HBase for the big data case, and it might be IRODS, uh, a, meta, a wonderful metadata management system for files, which we don't tend to use in the big data side on, um, on the uh, cluster side. Um, here we have streaming data done with Heron on the big data side, but nothing on the, on the cluster side, because there is no standard for doing streaming. Parallel runtime are do with possibly our extension Harp or Spark. Uh, and then on the cluster side, you have MPI, OpenMP, CUDA, etc. And there's lots of runtime being built for exascale machines. High level programming is a pig or hive or drill. From the big data side, this domain specific language is on the uh, um, cluster side. I had the nerve to put Twisted Tours platform as a service. That's our own system. But there is endless, uh, if you just look at uh, level 15B, you'll find lots and lots of examples in the big data space. Orchestration is Google Cloud Dataflow up here, which is Apache Beam. And then on the cluster side, you have Kepler, Pegasus, Taverna. Libraries, here I put our own Spidal Big Data Library, TensorFlow. Python has lots and lots of libraries. And libraries are very important in the HPC side, when I've given here some classic libraries, matrix, sparse matrix, and the many libraries MATLAB has. Languages are also a little different. C, C, C++, Python, and Fortran. And on the big data case, Python is shared, but you, tend, you would also use C and C++, especially if you're Google. But language like Java, Erlang, Scala, SQL, of course, and Sparkle for querying uh, graph databases. Coordination, there is nothing on the cluster side. Zookeeper for the uh, Apache side that allows you to do a distributed coordination. Caching also is not highlighted in the cluster side. And memcached is a very famous in-memory caching system for databases. Data transfer, well, it's not so clear how you do that on the Apache side. Uh, publish, subscribe is used for streaming data. Uh, you could, in principle, use Globus on both both sides. Because it's uh, basically grid FTP, which I mean, FTP is FTP, a famous technology. Scheduling, we have these interesting comparisons. Jan, Mesos on the uh, data side compared to Slurm, which is the standard scheduler, which is a little lower level than Jan and Mesos on the big data side. My guess is something like Mesos or YARM will actually become the standard scheduling system. And Slurm will get integrated into it. Um, Slurm is really not good at interactive jobs. It's mainly for batch jobs. File systems, I've already discussed HDFS. Object stores are things like Amazon S3, very common in big data systems. Um, Luster, or which is a shared file system. Notice these are, here we have a HDFS, which is a low level uh, file system with, with the long term storage of object stores. In, in, in the classic cluster, everything is files. And then we have lots of formats. Uh, HDF is a standard format in the scientific computing, FITS is one, I think, in astronomy. Um, all right, so there are. They actually have similar structure, but rather different entries, because they're optimized in different ways and have different histories. Um, so now we take, a, we finish those detailed discussions, and we stress just one thing, that uh, when we talk about clouds, and this is relevant for this whole section, clouds have infrastructure. Usually people initially focus in defining um, Clouds on the infrastructure as a service side. With the, uh, you know, that's how it was initially presented. Rent services, elastic services. But cloud is also notable because of the way it was set up. It spurred this amazing software activity, which was never seen before. At least I don't remember such an amazing coordinated. Uh, uh, software activity um, 
done by the community. And the community was just very big because there were so many large companies. The previous communities, like when web services were created, that community was much smaller than the community that created big data software. And that's actually sort of interesting. It might be worth studying why the communities have different sizes. All right, so here is a rather technical two slides, which I don't recommend going to any, any detail. They basically reflect the, the reverse engineering that we did on the programming models, which have some runtime which supports the processing of big data. And we divided them up into areas. For example, we have so-called coordination points. That's because typically these uh, runtimes support data flow. And data flow has something going from point A to point B to point C, and, and they do some linkage at these points. So those are coordination points. That's where you can change what's happening. That's where you can do backups. Very important. Spark, for example, is well known for its RDD backup system or, or um, caching system, and that happens at coordination points. It's not present in, say, MPI or classic other classic runtimes. Um, you have to actually map whatever resources you have, whatever computers you have to the maps in, in Hadoop or the uh, tasks in, in, in Spark and in the bolts, which are the equivalent of maps in Heron and Storm. And um, that you have to decide whether you're going to use containers, processes, or threads. Then we have parallel computing, and we have these entries here, Spark, Flink, Hadoop, Pregol, MPI. They all have different modes, and uh, sorry, they all are different modes, and they reflect parallel computing being universal, but being implemented in different ways. Uh, as we, when we discuss parallel computing, we will, we should note, although I don't, I don't think the slides do, the owner computes wrong which is reflected in most of these modes, which says if you're a computer and you're in charge of data points X, Y, and Z, you calculate whatever's connected to X, Y, and Z. So the only compute rules say where the data stored is where the computing is. And there's a reason for that. You don't want to transmit the data because communicating data costs time. So you try to do the computing where the data is. That's a very important principle. Uh, we have job submission. And then we just have here various job submission technologies, Slurm, Yarm, Mesos, Marathon, Aurora. The last four are all Apache type uh, um, job submission technologies. And then you would, and then you can of course take Python and actually have your client API be Python, and it can invoke these plugins. I mean, a typical uh, Architecture is to have the user sitting on a client running some powerful system, MATLAB, I mean, well, let's say it's Python. And that Python is not actually doing the computing, it's invoking the computing. So it's a proxy to the computing. It's a very important idea. People think some things are very inefficient. They're not inefficient because these slow technologies like Python are not used to do the job. They're, due, they're, they're the logic that invokes the job. Um, well, um, if you now look at the tasks, we have to migrate tasks. We monitor them, see when they're busy, see when they need to be moved off a busy core and put on a non-busy core or busy node and a non-busy node. Uh, elasticity, which uh, is certainly seen in OpenWhisk, is a key technology. Streaming and function as a service, those involve events. Those events have to be processed with technology like Kafka or RapidMQ. And then they're handed to OpenWhisk or Heron. OpenWhisk is function as a service, Heron is streaming. Uh, we have to study the task execution, whether we do process on threads, we'll have queues of work. Scheduling, we have to schedule the work. And this Spark, for instance, does a dynamic scheduling, Flink does static scheduling, and then generally you want all types of scheduling. So you need to be able to choose and plug in different scheduling algorithms. You also have to support accelerators. Sometimes your work is done on your Intel or AMD node, sometimes on an accelerator from NVIDIA or, or um, Intel, like <coughs> where it's CUDA is the software for NVIDIA. And nice landing with Intel's DAAL 
is an Intel accelerator. Now, all of these things are specified by a graph, and you need to be able to process that graph. So that's an important part of this uh, runtime. All right, next slide. This is the last slide on runtime. Well, we have messages. I told you the world is full of messages. And um, Heron has built a, Heron tells you how to implement messages. I pointed out that um, uh, that's when you're coming from the edge to the center. Those edge com systems communicate with the center of our messages. Data flow. Well, your system probably running in the center. Actually, can run in a distributed language. Flows data from one thing to another, and um, that is uh, that is done. We have our own system here, but there's also uh, uh, many ways of doing that, and uh, we're exploring that. And uh, there is also one has to look at fine grain, where the where the data is flowing in small and small sizes, and coarse grain. And uh, in some other talks I give, I distinguish between fine grain and coarse grain because they get mixed up in some of these systems. Um, here we have a comment on uh, communication. Uh, bulk synchronous processing is a is a style of communication typically implemented in MPI or our own system from GD2 called HARP. And uh, their MPI is probably the fastest. Data. Well, we better know what data system we're doing, no SQL, SQL, object stores, file systems, what have you. Then we also have to have streaming data. That's batch data, there are many choices. Streaming data gives us other choices. Data management. Well, we have to worry about um, uh, data being immutable. When you're doing a typical Hadoop job, the original data is immutable, you're not touching it. What, but there's mutable data, which is the results of the Hadoop uh, run. And we have to know how to deal with this data, when, especially when it's distributed and possibly inconsistent between the different nodes. And here, Spark with RDD and Heron with Streamlit has some technologies. Checkpointing, well, you can decide where you want to checkpoint. <coughs> And Spark and Flink and MPI and Heron all have checkpointing models. And they're different between batch and streaming. And we have to worry a little about some of these technologies are better at streaming than others. Heron and Flink are pretty good at streaming, Spark is not. MPI is dreadful. And then there's security. And I'm not an expert in security, except I know it's needed. And it's needed at the messaging level, the execution level, and the storage level. And it sort of crosses sort of everything. So this is when you sort of worry about building these systems, these are the things you worry about. All right, the next few slides just go through the 21 layers, one after another. Um, layer one, these are the cross-cutting layers. Uh, one through three were cross-cutting. This is message protocols. You probably won't worry about that in your work. Um, there are these standards which are being produced. Uh, to find the protocol for messages, I, meant, I mentioned actually the great web service, Halapaloo, which is a really most complicated protocol. Distributed coordination, well, this is a classic subject of the distributed computing course in computer science. Uh, Zookeeper in Apache is a famous implementation of some of the standard ways of doing distributed coordination. And there are various improvements of that which, and uh, get better performance. Many Apache systems just invoke Zookeeper to do their coordination. And it's basically, point, it all comes from the fact that when you're doing parallel or distributed computing, you need to have some consistency, because you have different jobs sitting there running. And they better have the same view of the world. Or if their view is different, you better know it could be different and adjust to it. That's what uh, Zookeeper goes with. Keeping uh, distributed systems uh, on the same page. And if they're not consistent, worry, appropriately worry about it. And the security and privacy is um, in a huge area. Lots and lots of people work about it. You see it on the web, and people mistakes are always being made by big, big and small companies. And we we'll always have emergencies. We have to go and uh, worry about our own computer with things like that. And there's all sorts of technologies which try to. And then there's sort of trouble about security and privacy conflicts with user convenience. And um, 
we have various technologies here, like InCommon is one technology mentioned, which is a way of federating logins so that you can um, have a login at Indiana University and use it in other places, like the National Science Foundation. In future systems, we use LDAP, which is a very simple database, which basically holds all the information which allows you to implement a security system by, because you store the, the details of the allowed users. OpenStack has a project called Keystone, which is a role-based authorization, which means that you don't just authorize people based on themselves, but also on their role. I'm in, this fellow's a professor, or this fellow's an IU student, therefore has certain rights. Okay, last two of the, uh, of the cross-cutting monitoring. So when your job is running, uh, you want to monitor what it's doing. You want to see problems. You want to do later studies of performance, so you want to know what went on. And there are various uh, um, technologies in Ambari, Negia, Scanglia, coming from Apache and the uh, HPC communities, which gather metrics and they produce alerts. Problem, um, like when uh, when we had an invade, um, when we had a corrupted uh, file uh, doing something dreadful on our Amazon account. Obviously, Amazon was monitoring that and they reported it to us. Um, fortunately, they were kind enough not to charge us for that disaster, um, that break-in, which was due to us. Actually, not sort of not our problem, it was somebody else's problem. But anyway, we, we uh, implemented that problem. Uh, there's Inc. as another monitoring system, which is higher level. I've already stressed the importance of infrastructure as a service. Um, <coughs> Which is just not cross-cutting. So the cross-cutting is one through four. Five is infrastructure as a service, and uh, it has all the things, including OpenStack. I put Docker, which could be in this level at uh, the DevOps level, um, which is the null because it supports the null hypervisor, and we will also use Kubernetes, which is at level six, the uh, DevOps also, and. There are lots of infrastructures as like Zen, KVM, and things like that. We discuss some of these when we discuss virtualization. DevOps, very important. Software defined system was key to Gartner, many Gartner uh, key te technologies, key emerging technologies. We have our own system called Cloud Mesh, which integrates many of them together LibCloud, Cobbler, Chef, Docker, Slurm, Ansible, Puppet, Celery. And um, we mentioned Docker earlier, and Kubernetes. Well, we've mentioned them many times. Interoperability, so you need standards for services. Compute Okai is a standard from the Open Grid Forum for um, cloud computing. Virtualization standards and storage, CDMI is a storage standard. So getting standards approved and agreed is a bit of a fight, because so people like Amazon are not terribly motivated to set standards because it's for better. They don't want you to be able to move from Amazon to Google seamlessly. They want it to be painful, so you stay with Amazon because they're winning. All right, file systems is the next uh, layer. Um, and files will always be there because you're going to have systems in the back end, but you may not expose files, and the high performance computing tends to, and also Windows exposes files to the user. But in most uh, commercial data management systems, you actually expose a higher level concept and object uh, with OpenStack, Swift, or Amazon S3. Um, and I say there's a difference between science, which tends to always use files, and commercial systems, which always use objects or higher level systems. Well, you're running almost certainly one or more clusters, they have to be managed. And I already mentioned Mesos, Yarn, and the Slurm, and then we have also the um, systems like Moab, uh, uh, SunGrid Engine, OpenPBS, <coughs> and Condog, which come from the grid, what was called the grid initiative, which is now sort of actually grid computing di died in the slough of the, the whatever it was. And, um, of uh, dis despair or something. Anyway, it did, it did not make it into the uh, productivity slopes. Um, 
And we have to worry not only about um, managing clusters, but also managing collections of clusters. And cluster management, scheduling, and things like that, they're all rather, and the difference between planning and execution. These are sort of four different things, but they're all mixed up in these technologies, and they're actually mixed up in the user's mind, including my mind. Um, but they are actually clearly distinct, um, and you, have, you should uh, worry a little about that. All right, layer 10, 11, 12. And 11 has three uh, components, 11, uh, 12, 10 is data transport, which I already mentioned when I looked at the software stacks. The Globus Online or Grid FTP is dominant in the high performance computing community, but not so in uh, commercially, although it is used. Um, ten most commercial systems are built around simple HTTP, HTTP protocols, and um, also they sometimes just send things by disk, by by UPS or FedEx. Um, well, the next um, set is the different data stores, which again we've sort of discussed uh, as we've gone through already. No SQL, SQL files. Uh, and then when we look at uh, NoSQL, we have graphs, tables, documents, and objects. And these are all different uh, logical structures with their own management uh, specializations. Originally, this was all dominated by SQL databases, commercially, and file managers in science. Now it's much richer. Layer 12, in-memory databases and caches. Object relational mappings going back and forth between those two views. Extraction tools. These are just sort of um, conversion tools to go from a, from different ways of looking at things to other ways of looking at things. <coughs> and um, this also includes the. It's also pretty important to keep things in memory because that's what makes things run fast, and that's an area where there's a lot of attention. It sits in the Gartner uh, emerging technology uh, as very important. And it's not much used in HPC, at least it is, but not by name. And it is very, very important in the big data world. Communication. Well, there's all sorts of important communications from publish, subscribe, as you see in RabbitMQ or, or Kafka. MPI is point to point messaging, which is the, to be essentially by definition the fastest. You have point to point, which is Process number one, talking to process number 73. And you have collective, which is process number zero, sending data to all 1,023 other processes. And there are various choices. It's not actually highlighted in Apache, but it ought to be. And they have different choices in functionality, performance. And performance has two features, bandwidth. How many bytes can you stuff down that path? That pipe per, per millisecond, and also latency. How long does it start to get things tooled up and get going? Um, publish subscribe has got longer latency because it has a very queues everything, and so setting up the queue for a given message takes a little while. Uh, where possible, you should use publish subscribe because it's got very important uh, robustness tech and convenience technologies. Programming. Well, I went through how to do programming. That's that runtime. And then we have Twister, Twister 2, Stratosphere, which is actually now Flink, Hadoop, Spark, so on. And then in the streaming case, we have Storm, Heron, etc. And we used to have, you, somewhere in AMB, you need to have either for basic programming model without streaming or one with streaming. You need to have one of those, else how can you do anything? Above that is, uh, is high-level programming, and um, you don't have to have high-level pro programming. Pig is a good example of a high-level system. Shark is Spark, SQL based on Spark, and so on. Hive is uh, SQL based on Hadoop and things like that. And Drill uh, has a, a SQL data interface to non-SQL data stores, including HDFS. Um, well, B is a little different. It's a framework, as, a, as opposed to what we just discussed. And uh, it's typified by the platform as a service, um, which is a sort of, it's not, um, <coughs> it's not a high level interface. A platform as a service is a collection of tools. Um, 
and that was what Google App Engine and Azure offer, and actually Amazon, of course, offers that now. Um, 16 is the uh, is the user level applications and libraries, and you'll find lots of libraries. Mahout, MLlib, MLbase for for Apache. R has got a wonderful collection of libraries and statistics. Um, <coughs> should have TensorFlow here. A new library from Google for deep learning and other machine learning. Uh, Cafe for deep learning, ImageJ for images. Lots of bioinformatics libraries and high performance computing as Scalar Pack and Fancy. Then we finally have in the last layer, workflow and orchestration. That's how you join jobs together. The architecture is you have a job, which is sort of a self-contained thing which runs and has an input and an output. <coughs> but then to do something real, you often need to put several jobs together. Because you need to, I don't know, cluster the, cluster the data and then visualize it. So those are separate jobs. And orchestration or workflow does that clustering. And they have much higher, these things you're joining together are very big. They each run for a long time. So you can, workflow and orchestration is not terribly performance sensitive. And um, we will illustrate this with uh, Access Pattern 10, which is a particular way of doing things with the 10th in this Access Pattern, which has workflow and orchestration in it. And you can all do this either with a sort of diagram where you stick the applications and draw lines between them to show how to link them together. That's a classic workflow uh, GUI. Or you can sit there with your Python code and say, run job one, one, number one, then run job number 23, then number 34, take the data from 34 to send it to 63, and also to 71, and run 63 and 71, and so on. So you can do this either from a, a scripting interface or from a graphical interface. <coughs> 